Hello and welcome to another episode of Super Coach Insider. My name is Ben. And I'm Chris. And thank you for joining us for another edition of our Team by Team Analysis, Chris. Yeah, actually getting into North Melbourne, the only time we will actually talk about them and enjoy it this year. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say this. Um, yes, Already bringing, putting north. Bringing five you seconds into the podcast. No, 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 no. Bringing you North Melbourne, which has more Supercoach relevance than Essendon ever will. <laughs> That's true. Uh, this year it is anyway. Uh, okay, so thank you very much. And thank you for all the love we are getting on the line. On the line. On the line. And you can find us. We are Supercoach Insider. Obviously, you can find us SC Insider 100. You can find us on all of our platforms. So Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, you name it. As far as YouTube, though, you have to search for our Supercoach Insider and you will find us there. Hit our channel up. All the audio platforms. So your Spotify, your Stitcher, your uh, Google Podcast, your SoundCloud, etc. You can find us all there. You can, actually. And uh, podcast is popping off a little bit. I, I don't mind the old potty. I don't mind it. And some people are being a bit quiet. Finally, SC Elite, shout out to you boys. I know we gave you a, a lot of a lot <laughs> of shit last... That was a fun, that that was was a fun, fun podcast. That was a good podcast. But they've just started doing their little uh, little pods, hitting up their cramping in for the, um, what is it, the Quick Pod Firecast, uh, Quick Fire Podcast that they're doing at the moment. Nice. So also I didn't give, realize they did that. Yeah, they've started up. Give them a little bit of love as well. Chris, we got a little bit of hate the other day. Did we really? Someone, someone watched us and it was it was obviously the Hawthorne, so they got a little bit triggered. We said they were, were they bottom four. Fan? Well, either they're a Hawks fan or they are with their cousin. Uh, I'm not sure which one it is. I'm like, uh, I wanted to actually. Uh, <laughs> I, I, went to town I did. Cousins. I was like, maybe this hits home a little too much for this guy. Um, maybe a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. Maybe. Anyway, so I was gonna. I was actually gonna go to town. I was like, you know what? You have violated our YouTube terms and conditions. So I just, <laughs> so I just deleted and blocked. Let that one go through to the keeper. I just that. the one. This is not a Tom Brown moment, right? But this I, is true. Yeah. And um, what, so obviously we've uh, been up to a little bit. Your uh, lovely partner's about to pop. So we're trying to nail these out as mu- as, as quick as we can to, to so that you can yes, enjoy um, fatherhood. So trying to get in um, and get it done. <laughs> so, you know, we don't want to leave you hanging for too long. But funnily enough, you would think if you do the mad dash to the hospital, have everything ready to go, right, thinking it's all going down, you would think you would pack the baby bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, turns out, not? turns out, I forgot one that is, bag. That is a fantastic first first run. Oh, mate! Look, you know, you, you're throwing everything in the car. You're doing the mad dash, and then before you know it, you show up at halftime like Adelaide in a grand final. <laughs> Absolutely, that's almost as bad as me doing three hours of research today and then not saving it and then having to do everything from memory. It was really good. Yes, so <laughs> this will be interesting for this guy here. But Chris, tell us about these rookies that you have learnt from the top of your head. Uh, yeah, so obviously North, um, you know, they, they did go in with a, a couple of great draft picks. And um, it's interesting that what they did with those draft picks. I'm quite surprised they didn't get any tools because they seem to be really lacking tools in their on their list. Um, and they went basically all mid uh, midfielders and mid-forward types. Um, so they had pick 3, 13, 36, 42 and 56. And they went with uh, Will Phillips, obviously, at pick three, Tom Powell, Charlie Lazaro, Phoenix Spicer, and Eddie Ford. And they also picked up two in the rookie draft, Patrice Walker and uh, Patrice. Pa- <laughs> Damn it, Patrice. Um, uh, Patrick Walker and Connor Menadju, obviously, um, uh, we've seen him around the ranks for quite a while. But they did lose quite a lot from their list. So um, Paul, a- uh, Paul A. Hearn was finally listed. Um, Been a long time coming. Talk about potential, but never going anywhere. Right. Um, ben Brown's obviously traded off to Melbourne. Um, Joel Crocker was delisted. Majak Dor was delisted. And it's just been announced today he's actually training with Melbourne. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what they do there. They may see him as a short-term forward replacement for Ben Brown or Sam Wiedemann. So um, there's that option. Sam Durden was delisted. Sean Higgins obviously went to Geelong. Lockie Hosey was delisted. Ben Jacobs finally was delisted. Jamie McMillan was delisted, which is super surprising. Very surprising. Um, Tom Murphy delisted. Jasper Pittard was also delisted. Ed Vickers-Willis delisted. Marley Williams was delisted. There goes half their back line. And Mason Wood was delisted, but he's also training at the Saints right now. Um, obviously, through the trade, they got Aiden Kaur, Atu Basanovalagi. I'm hoping I pronounced that right. Uh, and Jaden Stevenson and Lockie Young from the Bulldogs. So they've had quite a huge list turnover. And what that's going to mean for them this year is that their depth has taken a massive hit and they're probably again going to be bottom four. Um, can't see them really getting out of that. 
Uh, and they're going to be developing a lot of talent. So they do have some young kids coming through and there is some space for them to start round one. So we'll um, have a look at that. Yeah. Um, but obviously starting with pick three. Um, Just going to say, Chris, I'm really happy that Noble, like not happy, but Noble couldn't be in better hands that club, I think. And I actually think this podcast will be highly listened to because people do want to know thoughts on who's coming in, what sort of positions are going. Yeah, there's got to be a lot, a lot of, of preseason talk about the or about North Melbourne. So, yep. So if you're there listening, make sure you write that down. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. You did it. I respect you. And you can't be sitting there worrying, guys. Worrying is like a rocking chair. Gives you something <laughs> to do, but it doesn't get you anywhere. Write that down. <laughs> Absolutely. Worrying is like a rocking chair. Don't do it. Absolutely. Um, all right. So getting into Will Phillips, he was a clear number one um, midfielder in the draft. Uh, so that's the, the first to cab off the rank. He actually, um, what are you doing there? Fixing you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm trying to pleasure you, Chris. I'm trying to, trying to pleasure you. Um, he obviously played for Oakley, Oakley Chargers as an underager with Matt Rowe and Noah Anderson. So um, definitely played with some really top end talent. Um, obviously, was earmarked to take over the midfield this year, but then COVID hit, didn't play at all, um, but still regarded as easily the best midfielder of the draft. Um, inside, he has all everything. Um, One-touch footballer. He plays inside, plays outside, high disposal rate, high contested rate, um, good skills, um, tackles hard, strength. He's quick, but he's a little bit one pace. He's not really explosive. I suppose that's the only sort of knock on him, but he just racks up the pill like it's going out of fashion. He should be a very, very good um, super coach player. I think a lot of people have penciled him in their, their starting sides at this point. And I think there's two reasons for that. Last couple of years, we've seen those number one draft picks come in and make a super coach impact from the get-go. Uh, and people are expecting Will Phillips to do the same. And they're also looking for a consistent, you know, um, someone that's got good job security, but also got decent scoring power. And I think that Will Phillips at the moment ticks those boxes. So we'll see how he goes. Um, I think he's in most teams. I would be very surprised if you're running a midfield without Will Phillips. Um, but yeah. North still have a bit of mid-depth though. I mean, Anderson, Cunnington, Dumont, Simpkin, Polek obviously is probably more outside. Luke Davies, Uniaki is apparently tearing up. Yep. So then, you know, even if you throw Stevenson in the wing or a little bit through, Dom Tyson, another person, Taron Thomas that can run through. So I, yeah. I honestly think even though... The high amount's good, and I am looking at him, and he is in my side at the moment. But you're a little bit wary. He's, well, he's not guaranteed of getting a really good role. Like Walsh That's had it. True. Walsh had a dead set awesome role because he's a freak. And then Carlton was shit. Rao came in, big bodied mid that they kind of you know he just looks super impressive. Also, so he yep. was straight in the guts, and it really does depend on that role. And you can't just rely on someone who's heavily priced because I mean we saw that was it Bailey Scott highly priced had one good game then got injured or uh, ill and then he was dropped at round three or something yeah and then yeah. fizzled out yeah no and look you are right there is a concern there's a concern over their entire list this is what i mean about you know why they targeted midfielders because they've got a plethora of midfielders i'm surprised they didn't get at all like I, I just really don't understand it so um we'll have to see how they want to go about it and when you see the 22 that i've put together you'll see that there's just a lot of midfielders. So it may be that he's playing on a half-forward flank and he doesn't get the those real you know, crucial mid-minutes to get his development going. So we'll see about that. And secondary to that, the next one that they picked up is arguably um, an equivalent-style midfielder. Um, they picked up Tom Powell at pick 13, and he's 183 centimetres and 74 kilos. But he actually um, played for Sturt in the under-18s, Sandville under-18s last year, and he averaged 35 disposals. Hey, man! <laughs> he the definitely meatloaf. needs to. Now he's actually a little unit, hit completely inside, contested beast, um, very likened to Lockie Neal in terms of the way he plays his football and his ability to accumulate the ball. Um, so has good skills, good in close, good hands, and can just destroy it. Very, very good super coach option, and he is that little bit cheaper. He's around that one fifty k mark. So if he gets the nod in round one ahead of Phillips. That would be surprising. Um, so we'll see how that that falls into place. But there's there is a chance that he may even get the nod um, to go before Phillips. Um, both of which are going to be really super good super coach options long term. I do agree. If they get the role, Chris, if they get the role. Anyone that weighs like under 75, 77 kilos, I am just meat loafing all the time. <laughs> John, mate. And if they keep you waiting too long, what is she doing? I never know what she's doing. <laughs> I never know what she's doing. Mama, the meatloaf. <laughs> 
I never knew what he's doing. Oh, so good. Um, Development. Now, so, so moving on, they, they then uh, picked up uh, Charlie Lazaro. He's 179 centimeters and 74 kilos. Oh, another one. What's doing? <laughs> I never know what she's doing back there. <laughs> Ma, the meatloaf! <laughs> Fuck! And um, he's also another midfielder, uh, in, uh, mainly inside. And as a bottom ager, he played for Geelong Falcons. Um, ta- he's good at tackling. Is is high endurance, high agility, etc. Uh, they they actually um, uh, he's more of a development. He's going to be coming in behind these guys, but they're going to spend a little bit of time getting into him. Um, and he cause he's got potential to play forward as well. Um, speaking of forwards, the next one, Phoenix Spicer, one hundred and seventy three centimeters. So Caleb Daniel Height, sixty four kilos. Oh no. The <laughs> Jeez, they've gone for some real project players, haven't right. they? And well, I guess, well, they've got time, though. They, yes. they do have time. Now, Phoenix makes a little bit more sense. Now, he's actually played a lot of time on the wing. in the, Hey, in... Phoenix in a wing. That's ironic. Right. Um, and it's like elite speed, elite agility, elite run and carry. Um, when he actually... So, he was playing in the South Adelaide under-18s in the Sandfall last season. And then what happened is... Um, they obviously went, oh, this guy can play. Let's put him up a grade. So they played him in the reserves, and in the reserves he played in the in the forward line and used his agility to create space, etc. So there's a chance that when he... And I don't think that he's going to be able to play on a wing at AFL level at that height. It's just not... I don't think it's possible. Um, so if he comes in, he's probably going to play out of four pocket. Now, that's not necessarily great from a super coach perspective, but it is a list need. They don't really have a lot of his type on the list at North Melbourne. So there's a chance that he can play this year, and he's um, he's going well in the preseason. I'm not sure he starts round one, uh, but he had a fantastic back end to last year. He's also very good by foot and delivery inside fifty. He averaged five point seven per game last season. So um, someone to watch anyway. I don't I don't know if it's going to be a round one consideration, but definitely someone to watch. If he plays, he'll definitely go right under their noses. <laughs> I don't get oh because he's 173 cents. Yeah, he's small, Chris. Yeah, fair enough. All right, I'm just readjusting. You gotta my, lock that up, Chris. I gotta lock it up. You lock it up. No, you lock it up. <laughs> um, all right, the next one that they got is Eddie Ford. He's actually 188 centimeters and 79 kilos. He is um, more that medium forward type with a really high leap. Um, so he's got a bit of X factor, but he's got to work on his consistency. So he just floats in and out of games, which is why I was taken so far down in the order. Um, but he did, did come out of the Western Jets over there. And, um, yeah, I think he's probably not going to play at all at AFL level this season, but he's just definitely one to keep on the radar if he does develop. And they've got a little bit of scope for midfield in him too, but the likelihood is with the amount of midfielders that they have at AFL level, he's probably not going to be playing that position. Um, And then, of course, Patrick Walker, as I mentioned, he was taken on the rookie list, 186 centimetres and 76 kilos. He's also another midfielder there that's got um, scope as an outside uh, winger or a halfback flanker. And the the goal really for him is going to be the halfback or half forward and moving up and down that wing. Uh, precise kicking and great decision making. And that's why he's he's coming from the rookie list. But really, he was just overlooked in the national draft and they actually took him at number two in the rookie draft. So, um, oh, Which is technically the first because who went number one in the rookie draft? It was... Um, Adelaide? Uh, oh, yeah, Hayley. Hayley, Hayley, Hayley. went number one. Yep, yeah. Yep. So technically he's the first taken on the rookie draft. Uh, and the other one is obviously Connor Menadju. Um, I, I mean, we've seen enough from Connor Menadju to know what he's about. I don't think he's going to be a very super coach relevant. I, I personally, at his price, and I think he's about 200K, I'm not, I'm not really interested at all at looking at that. So you don't think Menadju is due? No. Um, but some rookies that you need to be aware of. Now, Charlie Common, unfortunately, is injured. I thought that he might have had a start this season in round one, but he is injured and he won't be playing for a while, so they're a little bit light on down forward. Tom Campbell showed that he can obviously mix it. Um, he's still 154K ruck forward, so there's a chance if Goldie goes down, bang, you've, we've got a, a really nice cheap price rookie that can come in and make an impact. Um, Especially with Ben Brown gone too. Right. And then there's some some guys that are around rookie price. Aiden Bonner, unfortunately, is injured as well right now. So he's not going to be playing early, but he'll probably play during the season. He's still only 245K. Lockie Young. So it's it's just to see what sort of role he comes in. I don't think he's in the best 22 right now, but there's a chance. Yeah, it's possible. Um, And he's 202K. It's really whoever impresses the new coach at this point, isn't it? As far as... Pretty much. You kind of have a look around. Everyone's what's, on a clean slate. Yeah, what's your best position? And then kind of, yeah. 
I do agree. Absolutely. Flynn Perez, um, he played a few games last year. Um, didn't go that well, but he's 193K at uh, in the defender. Um, and that is... Oh, Dom Tyson's still only 243K, but I got, I got no confidence in him being best 22 in the slightest. No. And Atu Basilovalagi is only 175K as well. But How disappointing is roll. Tyson been, though? Coming from Melbourne, remember that year he broke out straight away? Yep. Great premium, you know, great rookie numbers, should I say. Yep. And then he went to North, and do you reckon North just were better off buying a Dyson instead? <laughs> Probably, yeah. Uh, would have been more reliable, that's for sure. Well, definitely wouldn't have sucked as much. <laughs> Probably, I don't know about that. That's kind of the entire purpose of the Dyson. <laughs> I know. <laughs> you know it sucks then. Oh, yeah, fair enough. Um, now, let's look at the, the 22. So, as in the world of Chris, we've gone with Aiden Core. I think he slots straight into that third tall defender, um, even at 195 because he's got good foot skills. And um, Tarrant at fullback with Luke McDonald in the back pocket. We've got uh, Zebel on the half-back line. He's um, been touted to move back there this season and has been playing all preseason and training with the defensive group. So Zebel is now a defender, um, which means he should you know, normalize his scoring. So the, the thing with Zebel scoring for ages has been he goes bang and then he goes 40. <laughs> You know, yeah. Huge and then small. So hopefully on that half back line, he can you know get a consistent 80, 85 out of him. Yep. It, um, it definitely should make it more consistent. The ball will be down there a lot. They'll be looking at the skipper to you know, assist them in actually transitioning out. Absolutely. I actually, I actually see him probably even just you know being the captain side, trying to even tee up Luke McDonald as much as he can. To yeah, be handball to Luke. I yeah. like it. Well, why wouldn't you? you? You look at it and go, okay, if there's room around me, I would be giving it to Luke McDonald. Absolutely. And I think that that's... It's been mooted by the coach how they're going to be using Luke McDonald. He sort of teased him um, with some lockdown mid-rolls earlier in the preseason. And then once they started doing their match sim training, Luke McDonald was not doing that at all. He's just basically playing the exact same role that he dominated in the back end of last season. So, Which was? Um, halfback flank. Uh, he's basically playing Jake Lloyd at North Melbourne. That's what he's doing. Yep. Uh, now, obviously, Buckets McKay uh, at centre-half back. And I've gone with Atley on the half-back line. They're probably lack one runner um, that you know, that could come from their rookies. Could be um, young. Young could yeah, be. Yeah, the, the, and there's a couple here. So this is where Lockie Young could actually get a role because Atlee's been in and out of the 22 and I'm not even sure he really deserves to be there. But I put him there just as a fact of he's got the experience, probably has runs on the board, probably gets the first get, first go at it. But Rem- reminds me of gone in 60 seconds. He's like, hello, Atlee. Hello, hello, Atlee. That was a bad accent. I'm sorry, mate. Uh, now on the wing, I've got Stevenson. So he's actually been moved. So instead of playing full forward like he did at Collingwood, they've been playing him off a wing with stints in the forward line. So uh, and even some CBAs in the in the preseason. So I've got him lining up in the wing, Cunnington at centre with Pollock on the other wing. Um, on the half forward line, I've gone with Taron Thomas, Josh Walker, who's probably better behind the ball, but they don't really need him there. They need they don't have another tall with Charlie Combin down. Unless you're going to go with Tristan Cherry. Um, Walker's really the only other tall there. So I think he plays at centre-half forward. And Walker's definitely serviceable. Yeah, and look, he comes in and, and, and provides a serviceable role. He's not going to, you know, lights out, but he'll be, he'll be good enough. Um, I've got Aaron Hall there again, someone that on his day, he's easily best 22 and he's arguably the best five, but he just floats in and out of form. So, yeah, where he sits at halfway through the season, I've got no idea. Um, Zerha is out of the pocket, but he's also going to be playing a little bit more mid-time. Uh, I've got Nick Larkey, of course, out of full forward. And Curtis Taylor, who really played quite well last year. I think he's nailed down that other spot on the uh, in full pocket. In the ruck line, I've got, obviously, Goldie, Anderson, and Simkin um, rounding that out. And this is where, the, it, where it gets interesting. So on the interchange bench, I've got Phillips, I've got Trent Dumont, LDU, and Marnie. So three of those guys are really all midfielders. And then you've got Marnie. So they don't really have some flexibility on their bench to go to. But if you look at their depth, really it's, you know, they've got Powell, Scott, Campbell, Cherry, Garner, Boston Villagi, Bonner, Perez. There's not really a lot there. Like I wouldn't be like jumping to that depth chart and being like, oh, we've got great depth. Um, yeah, so it's going to be a, a tough year for, for North. And a, yeah, I, I suppose the coach is really going to be playing people in different positions, trying to work out what works best for them and trying to develop them. But yeah, it's going to be a long year, unfortunately. 
Yeah. I also think it's time for some of those young guys to take the most of this opportunity to step up. They've had a huge list transition turnover. So I'm really looking at you know, players like Luke Davies, Uniaki. I'm looking at even Scott, who's shown a glimpse, um, Tyson, you know, those kind of guys to actually you know, try and develop. Yeah, you're better off trying to shorten the other one, dude. Yeah, it's all good. Yep. Because otherwise that's not going to work. Um, yeah, interesting. So I, I do think Walker would be great for that that team in that transition. Um, I think he's a three club player, Chris. Who? Um, well, Walker. What? Yeah, Walker. I think yep. three uh, Geelong and then Brisbane and then North. He is probably one of my more favourite three club players. Do you know who my <laughs> least favourite three club reject is, Chris? Who's that? Fucking Polak. <laughs> what an absolute dog. Like at least You love him. At least you do love at least him. James Stop it. James Ace at least got squeezed out, which kind of made me happy. And he's at he's in Fremantle, so I'm like, okay, like I can deal with that and I don't hate him as much anymore. But Polak, right? Went from Brisbane, wants to go home to Adelaide, and then I think has his girlfriend in Victoria, so then he gets like, Oh, I just want to move again for the money. Yeah, I mean look, Pollock is Pollock is a spud, so that's it. That's all I've got to say about Paul Hank. Yeah, that's true. I think that's fair enough. <laughs> uh, so that rounds us up, Chris. We're going to now look at uh, what premiums and, and the rest. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, Toddy Goldstein really is the, is the, is the main one. but Probably the, uh, the only premium, I dare say, is Todd Goldstein. Now, Chris, this is going to sound really mean, right? Is because it? he averaged 112 in 2020. He had I see a, a, you. He had a great year in 2019 also, right? So when you look at 2019, he went and averaged uh, 112.2. So the last couple of years, he has actually done a lot. He's done a lot of great things in the last two years. But for me, Chris, I actually think his time is coming to an end. Uh, As well, look, he's just basically guiding the, the guys through, right? He's, yeah, you know, he's just there for the pay t- for, the, for the weekly pay p- packet at the moment. But I think he's, he's still serviceable. I, I think they still great ruckman. I still. think they still need him. I, th- I still think he's a great ruck right now. And this is going to sound really cruel. He's thirty three this year. Mm-hmm. Not that big of a deal considering rucks tend to go a little bit longer. Right now, he averaged one twenty four the first twelve rounds and then eighty four the last five. He went eighty uh, one forty one in the first five. And he went absolutely downhill and then picked it up a little bit again. Now, here's the reason I'm thinking of, right? So, it averages in losses. So, I've gone a little bit deeper in this. Yep. I so love it when you go deep. Averages in losses. In 2020, he went 104.6. In 2019, 106.1. 2018, 97.5. 2017, 90.9. 2016, I think it was 99.7. And I think in his career best year, when he averaged like 128, I still think he only he only got 108.3. In losses. In losses. And so where do you see year, North this year, mate? Well, I see them as second last still and or last. With, with Essendon obviously coming up the rear, right? <laughs> no. Well, I think Adelaide <laughs> and... Oh, oh, oh mate. <laughs> I'll tell you what, there, there will be there will be some Essendon supporters, there will be some North supporters out there, and they're just sick of you stomping on them, Chris. I'm Step sorry. on my head when I'm drowning. What a, what a great friend. What do you mean, what? John, this is completely against the rules. <laughs> yes. No, um, look, I, I do. Well, I, I think they know it. They know that they're, they're in rebuilding. a transition. Yes. You know, that it's, it's, it's common knowledge that North aren't going to have a great year this year. Like, whatever. Okay, cool. Well, at least they've got a a damn good draft pick that they can start rebuilding their club around. Yes. And next year they'll probably come in, get a big, get a nice tall, you know, and, uh, and rebuild from there. I think they'll be all right. Chris is just deflecting because he knows that North Melbourne and Adelaide are at least 12 to 24 months ahead of Collingwood in their rebuild. <laughs> nah, man, we'd, we've had our mini rebuild this year. We're good to go. We go straight back up. Baby out of the bathwater. You're right. We're going to try and pull a, um, uh, what uh, uh, Clarko, you know, they just drop out of the eight and then bang, straight back, back in. Straight back in, yep. never to be seen again. Next premium, Luke McDonald, 512K defender. Now, I'm huge on him. Yes. Now, he, here's the thing, and I've been, he's someone that I, I think I underrated a little bit and I'm definitely warming to him. For me, it could be similar to Doherty of a couple years ago when they needed Doherty to stand up and he mm-hmm. went absolutely big. Everything went through him and I see everything coming out of North Melbourne going through McDonald. And it's obviously going to be down there a lot. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just another one. And he can clear. Stop on my head while I'm like drowning. he he can he can clear like you know like second grandstand kind of just go straight over the first grandstand clear everyone massive yeah. monster boots. So S- so there's a couple of question marks about it because obviously how does Aiden Core 
um, impact him and Zeeble going into that defence. So uh, Core, are, Core won't really impact him. I think well, Core will play a bit more lockdown and then free it up. I'm hoping so too. I don't think Core will play the same role that he played at GWS where he was getting all the kickouts and, and doing that. I think it's definitely going to be Luke McDonald's back line. He's going to general that defence and it'll be get the ball to him. Yep. It'll be like like how Whitfield is when he's there and like how Lloyd is. It's yeah, pass the ball to McDonald. Yep. For me, it's uh, Core and Tarrant will be playing the taller uh, opponents. Absolutely. And McDonald. Now, this, this is the reason that people are a little bit skeptical of McDonald. And this is why I am slightly skeptical on why people think he's overrated or overpriced and never going to achieve greatness. Now, in 2017, he averaged 91 the last nine rounds, right? He got very excited. We were big on him that year. He got very ex- People got excited thinking the next year he was going to go from an 87 average because he averaged like 90. One for that nine round period at the end there, looked to dominate, and then he went and averaged sixty three point six over forty two rounds. Yeah, well he it was sixty three point ro- three. It's all role dependent though. Over forty two rounds, it, including he averaged sixty three in the first seven rounds of twenty twenty. Sixty fucking three, Chris. Well, at that time he actually played midfield. That's even worse. Well, I know, but that's what I mean. Like, you know, when those nine games and then this next season rolled in and he's playing back pocket lockdown. Like, it was completely role dependent. And even last year, you'll see at the start of last year, he could play a completely different role to what he did in the second half of the year. So if he gets that role, he is going to score well. And all the indications right now is that he's getting that role. If he doesn't, fair enough, don't pick him. But we'll know in that... like. One game. All we need to see is that one preseason game where he gets 35 disposals <laughs> coming out of the halfback flank, and that's what's going to happen. And I just see, you know, a guy with his boot that can kick like kick that long from the kick out where he can run 30 meters and get 80 meters clearing on his kick. Yeah, man, I think it's a great pick. Yeah, if he's taking kick outs and they the man on the marks even further back, I, I honestly oh. see. For me, he's someone who I think, again, and this is, we're trying to argue both sides here, and he does scare me, but he has that hurt factor where he could outprice himself very early and it could be really hard to get him. Now, in the back end of last year, he averaged 118 from the last 10 rounds. Now, let's read these scores 122, 136, 95, 138, 119, 144, 94, 82, 121, 131. Now, he will, apparently, this is what the talk was, he'll settle in defense, and he said, I just want to play the best position for my team, and I reckon at the moment that's in the back line, especially with a few experienced guys leaving at the end of last year. Now, I see a lot of that ball going through his hands out of that defensive line. I don't really rate Zebel as much as a kick. I think he's a great mark. I think he's good for putting that body on and good decision-making, so I think he'll be really good in that back line and will score consistently, but everything, I think, as much as possible needs to go into McDonald's hands. Absolutely. And I mean, if you just purely look at disposal numbers, right? From round one to round seven, he had 10 disposals, 12 disposals, 12, 21, 15, 12, and 13. From round eight, he went 18, 35, 18, 33, 24, 30, 27, 17, 19, 28. He just started racking the pill up because he was that loose behind the play. So obviously... Yeah, it's a, it's a key it's case. It's a huge, huge role shift. Yep. So... Yeah, um, I understand the trepidation, but I don't think I don't. I just think if you watched him play, you would be like, okay, he's a great super coach player now and a great super coach option. I think there's four guys that can potentially average one ten in the back line this year. He's one of them. Yep, so, I agree. He might fizzle out and do nothing, but he is definitely someone he's got the, who's he's got the potential potential to be top six yep. and definitely pushing. He could be the Lloyd of yeah North Melbourne. He he reminds me of like Doherty again when yep. they needed someone back there. Other teams, other good teams, they rely on sharing it around and then having a couple of outlets, etc. Whereas North, I think a lot of it's just going to be reliant on him getting it out. Well, you got to remember, Zebel's not a great kick. No, that's what so. I mean. That's why I think he'll handball off. Uh, okay, so that's a really good coverage then on Luke McDonald. Now we'll go into uh, Ben Cunnington. He's a fallen premium. I can say, well, premium because he put up really good numbers before he fell off a cliff in 2019. <laughs> Uh, here's the issue though. He's he's 30 years old in 2021. He's 439k. So some people are looking at him. I think he's too expensive, unless you think he's going to start averaging 110 plus and pushing those numbers. Like I said, he he averaged it. So flashback 2019, he averaged 83 in the last eight rounds, but averaged 114 in the first seven. So mm-hmm. he 
Definitely had an impact to 2020. I can understand people looking for cheaper options, but I think you're better off finding 50K and getting Rao. Yeah. Look, I've had this conversation quite a bit with a lot of people and I really like Ben Sorry, Cunnington. 60, 60K. But you hit the nail on the head. Is he going to be a season-long keeper? And if you can't see it, and then what? So okay, the, what are you going? What do you think you can average? And if you can't see him being a season line keeper, you can't pick him up at four hundred thirty nine k, because you're not going to really make enough money. Like, what's the? If he averages one hundred five, which would be a serviceable M eight, he's only really going to go up what eighty k, ninety k. It's not really enough. You haven't made enough money to justify it. So you're really just trying to sort of like the reason why I was getting him was to try and extend out my midfield. Yeah, yeah. Trying to get to M6 with like a 450k player. Um, and Ben Cunnington, I think he's a good option at that price. I just don't think he's going to be anywhere near top 10 midfielders. Yep. And I, what, what I've actually found in my team at the moment, and this is all conjecture, if I'm looking for someone around that price point to buff out my midfield and someone that has that potential to be a top 10 in their line, I'm actually looking at even putting in a Caldwell at a 350, yeah, and then that way a, yeah. he's a forward, so it's easier for him if he hits 90, he can go into the forward line. And I haven't seen enough of him yet. I'm just looking at no. pro- price point, possible role, new team, and he could, if he has a good role, average 90, and then you can then swing him into that forward line if he's good, or he'll make enough money to kind of move him on. Yeah, and I mean, there is positives for the Cunnington selection. Like, you know, since 2013, his lowest average is 93. So, I mean, that's not bad. His highest average, unfortunately, was 102.3. Yep. Um, so, he, does, you know, let's say he's going to go between 93 and 103 at, at absolute max. He's also been fairly reliable for games outside of his back injury. Just pass on him, guys. Draft league, 100%. Not in standard. Draft league him. You, yeah. you, you said it there, 102. He doesn't play enough time on ground ever in order to be a keeper in and, standard. And the problem with back injuries is that they linger. So even though the reports have been really, really positive about his back at the moment um, and that they're managing it and it's working well and he's gone to all the training sessions, he's actually killed it. His first, you know, preseason that he's, he's done this. Is he going to average enough to be a season keeper? No. That's And that's it. It's the only question you need to an- answer. Yep. If you think he is, go for it. You know, honestly. It's, yep. it's not a bad selection. It's just not a great one. Again, this is just our opinion, guys. You could be sitting there at home and highly disagreeing, getting all worked up, being like, But you don't say that. But <laughs> just deal with it. It's opinion. Um, okay, next one. Now, Jed Anderson. We're just going to go a bit more oh, draft relevance because, oh, should, look, Jaden Stevenson, should we touch on? Uh, yeah, let's just go through Jaden Stevenson Some and Zeeble yeah, um, that are standard relevant, and then we can go through everyone else. Yep. But yeah, okay, sounds good. Uh, okay, so I'm going to touch on quickly Jaden Stevenson, three fifty four k. Um, look, he averaged sixty five point nine in this year with Collingwood, not that great. However, in his first year of football, he actually got quite close. He hit eighty point three over twelve games in uh, so twenty nineteen, and he's been quite good since that. So for me. Stevenson isn't that bad of a selection, Chris. I don't hate it. I just hate the price point. So 350 k like I'd just rather take a punt on Corwell who's going to be getting more inside minutes. Um, look, the problem with a wing role is that you're capped in terms of your super coach output, and I think that he will be really good for them, and I think he definitely is improving his average. At 350 k is he making you 150 k Probably not. Could he go 90 plus? Possible. Maybe. It's probably more like he I, averages I, I, 86. I'm thinking like mid-80s yeah. cap. But, you know, the, he'll have games where he'll go 120 because he can also go forward and hit the scoreboard. I, I don't think it's a terrible selection. Yeah. But, I mean... it will be more surprising if he actually bangs off. There's just better value. Yep. Like, I think Zeeble can average 85 and he's 120K cheaper. No, wait, no. About 100K cheaper. Like... Yeah, I, like if, as a yep. money making selection, Caldwell again I think is probably a better pick at three fifty k with a better role spoken um, about. Yeah, uh, again, don't hate it. No, just would rather. I, I mean, I'd rather take the risk in draft. I, I don't think it's a standard selection for me. No, I agree. And in draft, so he first year he averaged sixty four, twenty two games. Second year, twelve games at eighty point three. I think there's definitely definite scope for him with a more friendly role to get 
yeah, mid to high 80s. Um, I can't see him going much past a 90, and that's if everything kind of clicks for him. Yeah, I don't think 90s in him. No, I don't think I don't. Just the way he plays his football, I, I'd get he's him. He's going to have games he goes bang, and he's going to have games he gets a 50. So in draft, then you're looking at what would you like him as? Like an F5, really? You could yeah. pick him up. You yeah. could pick him up cheap. I wouldn't mind him as an F5 or even a bench option if you can get that lucky. Someone might take a punt on him early because you know they see the role change and go, oh yeah, he's going to average a 90. For but North, I'm I'm getting that at value. Like that that'll have to be either a bench option or like last last forward option. Yep, and like many of us, it'll just be a surprise when you open your app because you didn't watch the North game. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, Zebul two fifty seven k now. Zebul has been. Extremely reliable for many years as far as scoring potential. So 2016 averaged 94.5, 2017 89.8, 2018 84.5, so a little bit lower. 2019 mm-hmm. again had some really good games in there, a little bit of uh, midfield role as well, 90.9. And in 2020 he had an average of 48, so he did definitely drop off with some injuries, etc. Yep. Well, from his third year, he averaged 79 and he hasn't dropped below that outside of last year yep. where he was injured. Which is why multiple I, I, games. Which is why I love the pick. I think yeah. even if he's in defense, I think, again, will assure up a bit more consistency. You can leave him in that forward line. He's not going to be the worst option. He could be your last upgrade. He's going to make you 100K plus easy. Oh, he's like. And he's just going to be chipping away getting 80s or more. And he will be someone that you can upgrade around that buy sort of period or after the buy. And if you get screwed by injuries, he's someone that you could even just kind of keep as your, you know, as your F6 as a, oh, crap, I don't have any trades, so I'll just hold him. You know, it, there could be worse yeah. things. There's it's a lot worse picks. And I, I, I think you're right. I think 80 to 85 is, is somewhere very, very achievable very, in very that role. Very achievable. And it, what, I would rather him be behind the ball than forward because, as I said, he just, goes, he just had a tendency to go missing. And then the next game he'll go 130. Um, he also likes the hard balls. So I think putting yeah. him in defense where it's uh, yeah, there, exactly. he, he's now more accountable. He's going to have to get a little bit of a mongrel in him and try and actually, you know, put some hits on it and try and actually put some pressure on. I think he will thrive mm-hmm. with that kind of accountability sort of, you know, in the, the pressure more instead of trying to run around and do as you like and come chase me, boys, you know. Like, I think he'll actually flourish. Well, they need him there because obviously they lost their, uh, I suppose, their small ball enforcer in um, in Marley Williams. Jamie McMillan's not there either. I mean, they really did lose a couple of guys in the back line that were really important. So, and what better player to be the general in your defense? Yeah. Like a heater Shaw, you bring in Zebul, he can be the general. Now, someone speaking, that can handball to Luke McDonald. And a general, it's perfect. <laughs> I mean, Zebul can kick it out in the full eight times, just like Heater, the general. And now, with the, with the out in the full actually gaining you points, you know, it's totally worth it. It does not gain you <laughs> points. No, that was a, that's just a rumor. That's just a rumor. It's not confirmed. Um, yeah, no, look, I like the Zebul pick. And I, yep. I think at that price, I mean, there's a, there is a couple of um, other guys around that price in the forward line. But Has he left your side? No. Nah, literally day one, opened it up, Zebul at 260K. Yeah, I'm going to do that. Yep. Danaher, Zebul in my side have not left. No. Um, and the reason is that some people are saying, oh, yeah, but they're they're expensive and they're going to get injured. and They're basically rookie price. I know, I know, I know. So this is, <laughs> this is the point as well, is that the one I was making was – with these kind of players, right, you pay for 250 he's going to make you money. And worst case, he shits the bed, gets injured early, or you know, if, if that happens, you downgrade to a rookie, no harm, no foul, you've got the money there. He's going to be so highly owned that even if something goes wrong, you're not going to be it's a safe pick. that disadvantaged. Yep. Right? So, And even then, if he plays you six to eight games, then gets injured, you can probably upgrade. Oh, yeah, easily. Easily. And it's, it's it's not as much risk as everyone thinks. It's not like you're wanting him to play 22 necessarily. You kind of just want him to do his role, get you 80s, and then move him as a stepping stone. That's he'll, his role. He'll be over 300K by the time it's round five. Like, easily. Like, he'll be 320, 330K by round five. So, yeah, I don't... I, like, and this is the other... The same with Danaher, right? Uh, Danaher's a 240, so it's even cheaper. All you really want from Danaher is two huge games back to back. Two hundreds. Bang. Or like he kicks a bag, you trade him out. That's all you need. So Well, hits a bag, yeah, kicks a bag, his break even will drop heaps, and then you yep. just ride that for a couple of weeks. And if he goes bang again, then Absolutely. you're laughing because then he just jumps up again and break even goes even further down. I and think I think for me though, is that um Zebul still has that high ceiling potential. He but does. Yep. being more consistent, I think it'll be it'll he'll be a little bit more of a slow burn, just nice gradual Price increases until he hits, you know, I reckon he could easily get towards 400. 
Oh yeah, easily. Yeah, yeah nice and steady. That, yeah. Nice and steady, and then you Just, can. And he'll be him. a slow burn. That he'll be someone you yep. keep until the buys, and then you get rid of him. Yep. And then as long as he doesn't get injured or knocked out, because classic Zebel. Classic Zebel. Well, yep. yeah. So that, that's that's my opinion on it, and you just hope that he has when it's around that time that you want to move him on. You hope he has one big game, and then you just ride that coattail for a couple of weeks, and then psh, out you go. Absolutely. Uh, okay, so that pretty much hits us for a lot of these standard relevant. I've seen a few people go with Jai Simkin. Uh, I'll touch on him quickly. I have quickly. no idea why. 499k. Now, well, look, Simkin, he did say that he wants to be more consistent. Of right? course he wants to be more consistent because he was super inconsistent last year. Talk about, yeah, stating the bloody obvious. Yeah, um, yeah so look, he, that's what he did say, though. He did say that he, um, he wants to be more consistent, so he bulked up in the offseason. He's pulled a little, uh, little fife. Mm-hmm. As they say, so he's bulked up a bit. Apparently, he's been a standout in the drills this preseason. He has really been uh, firing, ready to improve, looking for more consistency with laps, less lapses in performance. And this is what we're talking about. And he knows less lapses in performance. So he averaged 120 the first six rounds, then averaged 78 the last 11. Mm-hmm. So over the season, though, he had uh, 900s, including a 131, 140, 144. Hurt his ankle in round seven on 57. Okay, so his true average is actually uh, 98.4. He also got tagged by Kernow in round eight on 35. He got finished on 35. So he got hurt his ankle, then got tagged, and absolutely dropped a whole bunch of coin. There's a big difference between his good and bad performances, and most of it's re- relatable directly to how his field kicking is. Honestly, he can butcher the shit out of that football when he wants to. And it's so frust- it was so frustrating watching him last year. Getting the ball, not an issue. Kicking the ball, absolute issue. And I've got no idea why. Maybe he was just fatigued in the back end of the year, but the start of the season, he looked like he was unstoppable. Well, it's hard trying to carry a team, Chris. <laughs> yeah, especially a team like North. Um, actually, I would, and unfortunately, he's a little bit more expensive because he had a really good back end of the year. I really like Jed Anderson. And it looked like he finally got over his injuries last year. He missed a couple of games, of course, because classic Jed Anderson. But from round eight, he went 116, 144, 100, dropped down to 48, 143, 140, 81. Then he missed a game, then came back with 108, 89, and finished with 174. Um, So a guy that's got a really, really good top end now, um, he's obviously got that role. He's playing pure midfield. It'll be interesting to see if he's able to continue that role or they see him as a different player. Yeah, well, I mean, now Higgins is gone, so that kind yeah. of probably helps free that up. But he did average 77.7 with Cunnington and 111.4 without. Oh, that's a lot. So I, I suppose it's only a three-game sample size without Cunnington. It is, but uh, it is interesting. No, so with Cunnington, you mean? Yeah, sorry. So he yep. started off slow and then yep. had a lot more games without. And uh, I do think with Higgins gone now, I can also confirm that Neo does not like Mr. Anderson. <laughs> Boy, how good is uh, going to be the new Matrix movie? Can't I wait know. for that one. Hey, y'all. I know. And, well, most people that, you know, in school sort of days weren't even born when the first Matrix was out. So I was born in it. Um, all right. Now, the other, other another midfielder that um, we don't know what his role is going to be like, um, Trent Dumont, yes. obviously. Another one who actually averaged 10 points per game more without Cunnington. Yeah, and look, he's a good midfielder, but if he, but he doesn't seem to be able to get the role. So for, I don't know, like, who hates him, but... Sometimes he comes in, he's got a role, and he absolutely cleans up. And the next week, his role's completely shifted to something else. So, uh, yeah, I can't put my finger on exactly how to read Trent Dumont. And that that bodes really badly. Because I, obviously, I don't think he's yep. standard relevant. But draft if you want to try wise, and pick him up in draft, oh, leave at him 100 for, average. 101, 1.2. I'd be leaving him for sure. You know There's who's something- a better pick? Cam Guthrie. <laughs> Imagine if I wanted him head to head, Dumont versus Guthrie. You would have absolutely, you oh, would have yeah. said call quicker than um, the Sna- Petrarca bet. Snap call. What up? Um, yeah, so Dumont for me, I, I would be leaving him. He averaged 106 the last 12 rounds. Again, I think averaged more with Cunnington. Averaged 90 the last six rounds. So completely fell off. And from round seven to where, round 11 is where he did his damage 139, 122, 126, 110, 131. Absolute heat patch there and yep. then fell away quicker than anything. So I don't know. I'm a little bit concerned with that. And for me, I think he these kind of guys are kind of uh, filling the, the role and they're biding time until people like I think Luke Davis-Uniaki will come in. He was what, top, uh, pick three. 
and he's bulked up a bit more. He is definitely a talent, and I think he will actually, at some point, whether it's this year or soon, he will throw other people out of that midfield. It'll be interesting to see how they work it this year. I, I do think he's he's very talented, um, and he's having a great preseason by all reports, but not someone that I'm even going to entertain. You're talking about like LDU? In, yeah, right. yeah, in standard right now as, a, as an option. Standard, You've no. You've just got to watch him. Like, you can't bank a breakout. What's his fifth year or something? Like... 80.6 average, he's yeah. 432k. He's too expensive for standard, but for draft, he is a definite smoky. He is a midfielder only, which means that you can, at that 80.6, there's a lot of meat on the yeah. bone. People will have their midfield sorted by the time he comes up, and I could easily see LDU going 90 plus if, oh. if he continues the way that I'm reading, and I am big on him in draft leagues. You can get him last, throw him on the bench, 90 average, I reckon he'll go. Well, here's the problem with North in or general. More. Is that yeah, L, like you've got LDU, you've got Cunnington, you've got Dumont, you've got Anderson. All of them are so similar. In the, the, oh, I think LDU is a little more dynamic. Uh, is he? I don't know. Cunnington's obviously the, the best, but I well, don't know. Cunnington the, the, plays 70% time on ground needs, anyway. needs something, and this is what leads me to this. I don't mind this in draft. I think with Higgins gone, you can trust someone like a Taron Thomas to get a lot more midfield time. He's got that X factor that they lack in that midfield. And I think that he'll be getting more mid time this season. So someone to watch. I don't mind it in draft because he's only average 54. You can pick him up on your bench. But someone that could definitely have a bigger impact this season. So keep an eye on Taron Thomas. I need to change these settings so you don't talk over me, Chris. <laughs> You've got the mute button. When a problem comes along, you, you must zip it. it. Zip it good. Zip it good. <laughs> um... Yes, I think it's called ducking. When Chris tries to talk and I talk, his voice gets extremely soft and mine will be dominant. And I think that we'll, we'll have to put that in when we do our, our joint podcast with the elites team. Yeah, fair enough. Just so Bomps doesn't try to talk over me. <laughs> um, okay, so continuing with the draft relevance train, uh, Anderson, as you said already, um, who else have we got? So Robbie Tarrant's probably the other one. Yeah, Tarrant's not bad. I think well, you know, 86. Between him and, him and Buckets, someone's got to be taking those intercepts outside of um. It won't be McDonald. Buckets. I think Tarrant, he could, Tarrant's still good for around that sort of 80, mid-80 sort of range. I think he's fairly safe as far as draft leagues. Aaron, Aaron just, sort of just gets injured all the time, though. That's he the, does. And whatever Aaron, reason. Aaron Hall, definitely a risky one. I would be benching him, if anything, because he's a waiver wire special at best. Taron Thomas is one that's interesting. Now, he averaged that's 60. I just, I just mentioned that. Yeah, but 62 in his first year, right? So, mm -hmm. I think in in keeper leagues, I would be aiming for him. I think he has great value. You'd be able to get him for basically nothing. And he could, if his body holds up, I think he could get closer towards that 80 mark this year. I think even more. I think yeah. you know, there's that, again, as I said, that, that type X player, factor type. Yeah. They don't really, have, like, Zerhar's the other one that has that X factor that they're trying to throw into that midfield mix. Um, but how cheap could you get him in a keeper league? Taron Thomas, oh, yeah, you could get for, you could get nearly for free. It's, he just it's hasn't be... shown it yet, I suppose. But no. I, I think everyone's aware he's got the talent. So, but you could get him cheap. I'd be looking at that for sure. Definitely. And I think that kind of wraps us up for the uh, the North Melbourne, Chris. That it was does. that was actually quite complex. That was forty seven minutes. That was that was long. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, North uh, have some relevancy this year that does extend past AFL and. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're, they're relevant because they had a, a lot of uh, changeover, some rookies coming in and a lot of younger guys sort of trying to find their way through. So I yep. think that was very interesting and I hope you have enjoyed us for this podcast. Excellent. Thanks, guys. Wonderful. Thank you. And next one will be, I think, Port Adelaide then, Chris. It will and be. And that will be dropping on the Tuesday morning. Yep. No worries. Anyway, until next time, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.